The 23rd Olympic Winter Games are now underway in South Korea, and last month, a team of North Korean representatives met with their South Korean counterparts. They agreed to participate in the Games and march under one Korean flag at the opening ceremonies. Well, Kim Jong-un is unlikely to launch another ballistic missile test while the Olympics are underway, but what about after the Olympics? Are we to see more to come from the Korean dictator? How should the U.S. respond? Well, joining us with some insights is Council on Foreign Relations senior fellow Korea expert Scott Snyder. Mr. Snyder, how significant is it that North Korea and South Korea are marching at the Olympics under one flag? Well, at present, uh, this cooperation between North and South Korea is a kind of limited time only uh, event that is occurring around the Olympics. Uh, there's some powerful symbolism around the idea of coming into the stadium together uh, under one flag. Uh, but the reality is that the two Koreas are facing off uh, in a kind of confrontation. Uh, and at present, we have not seen signs uh, that the inter-Korean uh, dialogue has addressed issues uh, beyond North Korea's participation in the Olympics. Well, after that recent meeting at the DMZ between North and South Korea, some critics said the South Korean government was a bit too soft on the North. So what do you think? Well, I think that the South Korean government certainly has an interest in trying to promote tension reduction both at the Olympics. North Korea's participation is a kind of insurance policy against any kind of disruption. Uh, and they have an interest in trying to lure North Korea into denuclearization talks uh, with the United States. Uh, but that's going to be a very challenging task. Uh, and so the advantage they have is that they will have opportunities to meet with very high-level North Koreans in order to try to put this idea in their heads. Uh, but frankly, the direction that the North Korean government is on and the direction that Kim Jong-un has gone is directly opposite to that. And so the likelihood that they're going to succeed in convincing North Korea to, um, to join denuclearization talks with the United States uh, so far we don't have any indications that that is going to happen. So a bit of a carrot right now with the Olympics, maybe not for the long term, but the title of your recent book is South Korea at the Crossroads. Now, how is this a crossroads for them now compared to the past? Well, for South Korea, increasingly, uh, they are facing strategic challenges uh, that uh, both in terms of dealing with North Korea uh, and in terms of dealing with the fact that uh, they depend on China for economic growth, while they depend on U.S. for security. Um, the question of where South Korea can uh, best position itself in order to maintain uh, its prosperity uh, is beginning to be an open question in the context of China's rise. And so I try to address that issue uh, in the book. I come to the conclusion that uh, at present, it's still in South Korea's interest to maintain a strong security relationship with the United States. Well, do you see improved relations coming? How would that benefit the U.S.? Uh, improved relations. Uh, right now, we have obstacles uh, in the inter-Korean relationship uh, and the South Korea-China relationship. Uh, in general terms, I think the United States uh, can benefit from tension reduction, especially because uh, it would require North Korea to turn around and go in a different direction rather than trying to threaten the United States with a nuclear strike. Uh, and in the context of the U.S.-China relationship, well, that's going to be very complex because uh, the current administration, I think, is moving toward uh, more of a position of rivalry with China. Uh, and increasingly, South Korea is going to find its choices squeezed uh, in the context of potential rising tension between, uh, between Beijing and Washington. And President Trump has always said that uh, China is the key. And publicly, he tweets out comments critical of Kim Jong-un. And then he warns of fire and fury. But what do you see happening behind the scenes? How is U.S. policy any different from the past? So the really significant development, in my view, under the Trump administration is that the United States has gone from asking China to cooperate on North Korea to uh, essentially trying to compel China to cooperate uh, on North Korea and essentially telling China North Korea is becoming a near and present danger to the United States. We will have to take actions uh, against uh, North Korea that might also uh, be costly uh, to Chinese interests, and you're just going to have to accept that. 
Uh, and so the main instrument by which to do that is something called secondary sanctions, where the U.S. Treasury can sanction Chinese companies that are doing business with North Korea. Uh, we've seen the beginnings of uh, the use of that instrument under the Trump administration. And the question really is, how does the Trump administration uh, lay that out? And how do, do the Chinese respond uh, if the United States takes a much more uh, aggressive role in essentially uh, putting unilateral sanctions on Chinese entities that are frankly breaking UN Security Council resolutions uh, and uh, allowing North Korea, enabling North Korea to be a threat to the United States. Well, those are the big question marks, aren't they? And I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on it. Scott Snyder from the Council on Foreign Relations, we thank you for your insights.